put in this computer. Recording. Like yep. Ron from Medford, or can see all of you in Verbally too. Well, that's good. I have some good friends in Medford, Oregon. All right. Hey guys, welcome to um, Pro Seller Talk um, webinar series. This is another webinar I'm doing here, and this is my very first one on Zoom, so I apologize if I don't have a clue of what I'm doing. So it's like anything else, you gotta put yourself out there and learn it. Um, I've watched plenty of training videos, but obviously those didn't do me that well, so we're gonna continue with this webinar anyway. I have Beth and Seth Moss, Moss, you say? Yes. Yeah. Um, with me tonight. Um, they're a, a mother and son team, which I find very interesting because those can be really challenging, especially when it's your child that's working with you. Um, so I find that um, interesting and I'm very curious to see how they get along and how they do the business together. I know that I do it with my wife and my two uh, sons and um, it can be challenging at times working with family, but it also can be rewarding because you get to spend time with your child that um, normally you may not be able to get to because he's older and he's living his own life and a lot of times they're out doing things other than kind of wanting to work with their family. So to me, it's been a real privilege and honor for me to be able to do it with my children. And I'm curious to see how their relationship is as far as the business side of it and how Beth got started. I read a little bit about your story and how you got started. And I'm real interested to see um, where you've grown from where you started because your story is very interesting to me. Hey, Beth and Seth, how are you guys? We're doing great. We're really excited to be here and joining you and um, we use Zoom too, but are not proficient at it. So it'll be interesting. <laughs> I'm not sure we're much help with any of it tonight, but but we can talk. So that's great. So kind of give us an, a back, little bit of a background on you, Beth, of um, how you got started. I mean, did you start on Amazon? Did you start on eBay? I mean, a lot of us. Um, I've been doing it a long time, and I actually started on many, many years ago in the '90s. Um, of all things, Seth, you might you might know this, but I actually started out with Pokemon cards with my son John Jr. And we sold thousands and thousands of Pokemon cards on eBay. And I thought for the longest time that's all we were ever going to be able to do is sell Pokemon cards because I couldn't think of anything else to sell. Or even if we did, it wasn't working at the time. So it's kind of interesting how we evolved. What did you get started in? Well, I, um, I started in 2003 on eBay because um, I didn't even know that you could sell on Amazon. So I started then and I basically just did it to sell stuff around the house. I sold a lot of homeschooling curriculum and things like that, um, clothes that my kids had outgrown, um, just kind of little bits here and there, but nothing like trying to make a real business of it. Um, and then in 2008, we had lost our jobs. And so I was trying to figure out something I could do. I still had a couple, I have five kids all together. So I still had a couple of them who were, um, homeschooling. And so I needed to try to see if I could find something I could do from home. And I went back to eBay and thought, let me just try this and see if I can figure out, you know, anything that I could do to make some good money on eBay. So I started with, um, uh, I started with, um, Jimboree clothes and I realized that I was really good at figuring out what would sell, but the market was so saturated that it was just so much work for so little profit. And, um, and so I ended up getting a job as a merchandiser at Kroger which if you don't know what that is, I describe it as those people that you go to the grocery and you ask them if they know where something is and they tell you, I don't actually work here. I was that person. All I was doing was moving things around on the shelves. So um, I did that for about a year. And, um, and one morning when about 4.30 in the morning when it was, pit, it was pitch black outside and I stepped off my... Um, my driveway and sprained my ankle, which caused a break. And I was immediately out of a job and no health benefits or anything. So, um, so I was laying on the couch and, uh, just kind of praying about what I should be doing. Cause I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do now. They wouldn't let me come back. I told them they, I could sit on like a little roller chair and roll around the store um, they wouldn't let me do that. They said it was a liability. So I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I have nothing that I can do but lay here. 
And, um, and so I ended up, um, trying to sell a little bit more on eBay. It was getting towards like, I think that was maybe in September, I think of that year. And while I was there, I, um, I thought, well, I'll ramp up my stuff on eBay, maybe sell some toys cause Christmas was coming. Um, but I was searching online for something, anything else. And I found Jim Cockrum and we had a lot in common because, um, his youngest daughter, he had four boys and his youngest daughter is adopted from Guatemala. I had four boys and my youngest daughter is adopted from Guatemala. So I was immediately drawn to him um, and his story of how that he was able to stay in Guatemala and still run his business during the adoption process. And I thought, that's what I want to be able to do. I want to, I want to have a kind of business where I still can have a life um, with, and still make money. So um, I started researching everything. And back then, um, this was like 2010. So the big thing was selling books on Amazon. And um, I, tr I really, really tried to do that. I love to read and I love books, but I was so not good at selling them. I just, I don't know. I just could never get the hang of it. Um, and I thought, I don't know how people are doing this where they're actually making good money selling books on Amazon. And so um, I was in a forum on Facebook and somebody said, man, I sent, I've got all these toys I'm sending to Amazon. By this time, it's probably like, November, I think it was. Um, and they were like, man, they're just flying off the shelves. And I thought you can sell toys on Amazon. I had no idea. So I took down all my listings on eBay, shipped all of my toys over to Amazon, marked the price way up and sold them all like as soon as they got in there. And, um, so I think that, um, just do it, seeing how fast that everything went during Q4 just really got me going of like, this could be a real viable business for me. Um, and then January came and so, um, all the returns started happening and I, you know, some of the things I was real new. So some of the things that weren't very good buys were sitting there and I was like, this is not good. I don't think you can sell toys if it's not Q4. Now, what am I going to sell? Cause I'm not good at selling books. And if you can't sell toys, um, and so I finally figured out that my real passion, what I really enjoyed doing was selling toys. So I figured that I would just learn how to do it all year long. And so that's what I did. There wasn't a lot of support back then for selling toys. Um, most people said, if I asked them, you know, can you do this all year? They would say, oh, sure, because, you know, kids have birthdays or, or, you know, there's certain things during the year, you know, they have Easter, sometimes they'll buy stuff for that, whatever. And, and so I thought, okay, well, you know, that's only like once a year for one kid, <laughs> like that's not gonna be a real business. Um, but I, it was something that I just really loved because I mean, toys are just fun to sell. So, um, and Seth had started helping me and so he was kind of working alongside me by that point. And we just started to learn on our own what kind of things were good to sell and how to find them and, um, you know, different things that, that would alert us to the fact that something was going to be a good seller. And, um, and so we just kind of started learning trial and error with a lot of error in those first few years. Um, and, uh, eventually Seth started to run his own business through mine and I'll let you tell, uh, he'll tell you his part of how he kind of morphed into his own thing. Um, but we kind of split up our businesses and then, um, a couple years ago, was that two years ago or last year? It wasn't last year. It was 2015. Um, we, I, I had written a course on how to sell toys when it was not Q4. Um, and we decided to put together a coaching group for it. And so we started coaching together. And so we were working together again, but I'll let Seth tell you just real quick how he kind of started his own. Cause he's, I mean, I was a mom with, you know, kids and lots of experience and stuff. And he was just a young guy. What were you like 24? I think when 23, when you started, he was like 20. Really? Yeah, how old do you think I am? I thought you were, <laughs> I don't know, I thought, aren't you 28? You're almost 28. 
aren't you? No, I'm not 28. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I, like my mom said, I was helping her for a long time when she was working on Amazon. And I would help her buy stuff in the store, ship shipments out. I didn't really do much beyond that because it wasn't my business. I was still working, uh, you know, minimum wage jobs at like books a million, which I love because I love books, but you know, it wasn't exactly paying much. Um, and around, around the time that she started really doing Amazon full time, uh, I had just gotten a pretty good job, but then immediately gotten into a car accident that left me with a concussion that I couldn't do any work myself for uh, about three months. And so I had lost that job. I had nothing I could do. Um, and I just, I needed to start making money. And I, you know, my mom was doing that. I'd been helping her for a while. So I said, all right, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to do what she does. I'm going to go out and buy toys and uh, I'm going to go with that. And we went through a lot of, lot of mistakes through that first couple of years, but, um, it, it ended up being a really good thing because, you know, here I am, uh, I think, I think now it's seven years later and, you know, I got my own business. It supports my own family. Uh, and I would never tell anyone that it had been super easy the whole time, but, um, now, you know, it, it's one of those things where I can take days off and, you know, we can do what we want to do while at the same time, uh, we're still able to, you know, provide a lot of service to people and, uh, especially with people uh, who want those rare toys. Uh, you'd be surprised how much feedback we get from people who just say, thank you so much. I could not find this toy in my area. And to me, that's not a big deal because I see tons of toys all around all the time because I'm always shopping. But, uh, you know, you never think about those people who are kind of out in like Idaho who don't have a Toys R Us around them for 100 miles. So they never see those toys. Um, so it, it feels good to be able to make, uh, you know, a kid's birthday or something happen because you had the toy that they were looking for in stock. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I started and jumped into the business there. You're 26, aren't you? I'm 27. Good Lord. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for your mom to say 27 and available. <laughs> <laughs> He's married. I'm, I'm married. Yes. There you go. There you go. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> so you you'll be 20 i will be 28 in March. okay thank you that's i knew i was right sort of so, okay so seth um after listening to you for a few minutes here um you said you made a lot of mistakes do you care to share some of the we all make mistakes and I think it's good for the audience to understand that you know we do make mistakes and kind of do you want to share some of what you considered mistakes that you've made? Yeah. Um, one of the main first things that uh, I got, because when I started, I, I was in no way a businessman. I mean, I was, I was a kid who had worked minimum wage jobs, uh, you know, never really been in charge of anything big before. So it was a cost of goods. I didn't understand things like, um, supplies for the business. Like, for instance, one of the main things that you have to have for Amazon, if you're going to do FBA, uh, is tape and labels because uh, they're one of the main things you need if you want to keep your stuff separate and you want to ship stuff into Amazon. So I didn't understand that. So in my head, you know, that was never a cost. But then later on, when I go to look at my bank account, I'd be like, wow, that's a lot lower than I thought it should be. And it was because I didn't understand the cost of goods and uh, returns on things. Um, I didn't understand Amazon fees all that well. So I would buy something for 20 bucks, sell it for 30 and think, you know, I made a good profit, even though really I only made about $2 on it because of Amazon fees. Right. Um, so I didn't understand things like that when I first started. And it led to some really hard months for sure, where I didn't make, sometimes I didn't make any money. Sometimes I went the wrong way. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, it was one of those things where you either learned how to do it or you drowned. So um, I made the mistakes and then I realized, okay, don't do that again. And uh, kept learning from it and growing for it. Now, when you guys uh, started doing toys, when you said you made mistakes, I can tell you, you know, baptized by fire. I mean, I'm right there with you. Um, but I was aggressive um, when I started out. 
I wasn't one that wanted to go wide. I wanted to go deep. I wanted to have a lot of one product and um, it was very successful with the hot toys, you know, when you could get them and, and work on smaller margins. But um, also, you know, when you talk about mistakes, yeah, I remember getting stuck with pallets. I mean, <laughs> and some people would panic, you know, I didn't do that in the beginning, but you, as you grow, you know, I got to the point where we were doing pallets and stuff and buying it. And um, the one thing that I think that people need to understand is that you're better off going wide and deep more so than ever now for the simple fact is you don't know when Amazon is going to a jump on your listing and kill the value of your product or two, just out of the blue say, guess what? We're just going to restrict your product now. We don't want that brand here anymore. So there's a lot of different things going on nowadays that they didn't have even a year or two ago. That makes it very, very difficult for someone that's, you know, selling toys or in any category for that matter for Amazon decide to, you know, say that we're going to brand restrict it. And how do you know that you, by, when you go to get it and you buy it, the brand's fine. It gets to Amazon and two weeks later, Amazon says, Oh, guess what? It's our sandlot. You play by our rules and we don't want it here anymore. And we're going to restrict that brand or we're going to restrict it so that we can sell it. And you can't, I mean, we know Amazon has their own ways of doing things. So it, that's very challenging, and, and that's why, for the most part, and I'll get into your story in a second, why John and I, we started out in toys, you know, when we started first on Amazon, and man, we started out with $500, turned it into a quarter of a million dollars in our first year in sales, just flipping it, flipping it, flipping it, flipping it, flipping it. But I learned that retail arbitrage um, and online arbitrage is more and more people getting into it. Yes, it's still viable, but for me, it wasn't a sustainable market model. For the simple fact is, once I sold it all, if I wanted it, I had to go find more. So I would like, we got more into replenishable goods, which first of all was wholesale. And now this year, I think we ended up with $1.8 million in sales and we do about 99% private label. We just strictly private label. And let me tell you, it's a big thing. It's a, it's a real good benefit for when you've got a private label out there and we sell on other markets like Walmart and other things like that. But it's a, it's a real good thing when you have replenishable product and you just got to replenish and tell your factory to send you another container because you're selling the product. So, but I'm like you, I mean, this year a little bit because of the things, the way that Amazon has changed and how sellers can do things. We did do some arbitrage this year in fourth quarter. And one of the things that we did, and I know Ada, you know, she's on this call and she can vouch for, her cause she heard it the other night when we had a, I have, um, my uh, moderators meeting and she's part of my moderators and I was talking about how for fourth quarter what we did as we got closer to the holiday where Amazon couldn't ship at FBA we went out and got all these toys and and here's a here's a thing for you here's a good tip for you guys my son John Jr. went out to the stores and he basically went in the stores found products that had good margins on Amazon listed them didn't buy them just listed them walked around the store for 20 minutes if they sold then bought them brought them home we shipped them how dare you talk? No, no, um, no liability, no, no investment needed. I mean, you just, uh, you want to talk about starting a business without even having any capital up front. Here's something where if you didn't have capital, this is what he did. Now he didn't make it, you know, a point of going to those stores just to go there. He did it while he was grocery shopping or his kids were at dance class or something like that. And he just walked around and it cracked me up because he literally told me what he was going to do. He went into the store. And I'll never forget, he was in the store and he sold this Mickey Mouse. He actually listed this Mickey Mouse, I think it was like $30 at Walmart. And it was going like for $90 to $100. And before he even got 10 minutes into the store, he had like four or five of those things sold at $90. Merchant fulfilled, not FBA, merchant fulfilled. So what's he do? He goes back down the aisle, purchases them, <laughs> takes them, brings them home and ships them. So I don't know if you guys have tried any of that with your toys thing, but that's kind of a neat scenario. Yeah, it's uh, during the end of Q4 from about, uh, I want to say the 17th to the 22nd or so, I generally focus on MF stuff. So I'll go out and uh, it'll be only purchases with the intent to sell MF. Um, so there would be days where I go out, buy three or $4,000 and stuff and have sold 2000 of it by the time I got home uh, with the ex expectation to sell the rest of it over the next couple of days. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a fun time when that, when that comes around. Cause you know, 
you you have this stuff in your cart and by the time you get up there you've already sold half of it and uh you're already trying to figure out okay how do i how do i get this stuff shipped before i go out to my next store you know it it's it's tiring but it's also a lot of fun because it's some of the easiest money in the world it is i mean it, it was it really is and it, and the other thing that i want to get into a little bit about is you guys seem to specialize in toys so for someone that wants to get into toys, fourth quarter is easy. We all know, and I, I don't mean easy as far as um, you know, a new seller coming in, but it really is not a hard, it's not a hard thing to do to be able to get popular toys and flip them. Um, that if you happen to get that egg thing, what is that thing? That hatchable, hatchable. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those things were going crazy prices. You know, it's like anything else. It's like the Teddy Ruxpin, the, the Furbies, you know, when they came out. You hit that hot, to that hot toy. I mean, the Xbox 360. I remember when the Xbox 360 first came out, John and my son and I, John, we, um, we ordered them right from the factory. And I don't know how many we bought, but we bought them at factory price. And by the time they came out, we got them. We were very fortunate. The market was scarcity. There was none out there. And we were selling these things on eBay and Amazon for, we think we paid 300 and we were getting like 900 to 1,000 for them and just popping them like candy. I mean, so there are a lot of things if you do your homework and you, you watch the market and the trends that you can make a lot of money on. I think a lot of people um, think that um, that's not the case. Fourth quarter makes it easier, but toys, like you said, toys, I know you just don't sell toys in fourth quarter. I know it's a big part of the business, but explain um, or go into a little bit more detail of what you're looking for off season for someone that's coming in since we're past fourth quarter. And they're like, I hear toys is a big thing. I want to get into toys. Um, do you stick with brand name toys, even though, you know, private brands like Walmart brand and other brands are, are starting to hit the market on Amazon now where before you didn't see the, their own private label brand on there, but now it's becoming more, more of a trend where people are willing to pay for the non-branded items and they pay well for them. So what do you guys look at past fourth quarter as far as toys? Um, are you looking more seasonal? I mean, I know I can go hours just talking about, you know, movies coming out and things like that. And I'm sure you look at that too, to see what kind of toys are coming out just based on movies that are going to be coming out in the near future. It kind of gives you an idea of the toys that are going to be coming out. Yeah. Um, during the year, about 90% of my sales come from toys. So, um, and there's, I mean, there's always, there's always something that's not a toy in my cart wherever I go, but um, the majority of it's toys. And there's, like you said, there's always a seasonal aspect to it, but there's also a saying I have with toys and that there's always something new. Um, even like last year when Q4 was coming around, we kept telling people that we were teaching, keep your eye out because there's going to be new stuff even right around Black Friday, because every year they release stuff right around Black Friday. And sure enough, right around when Black Friday came out, there were um, about six different things that were uh, like, I think one was the Aqua Doodle that yeah. if you had bought it for 10 bucks on Black Friday, um, you know, you would have walked away a couple weeks later selling them for 60. Uh, and there's always stuff like that happening throughout the year. Um, and not necessarily with that kind of crazy margin, but uh, there's always new stuff that's popular. So, uh, you know, everyone kind of focuses on what is an established brand, but we always tell our people, you know, there's always the next new thing in toys. So you always need to keep your options open. And some of that's seasonal, you know, sometimes uh, like in the summer, you'll see toys that have like kind of a water specialty to them, whether it's a slip and slide or a squirt gun. Um, and they'll become that next big thing. But then you come around to winter and people start focusing on Christmas and, um, you know, it becomes uh, things that are interactive. And, um, for instance, bigger items around the winter season, like uh, doll houses and stuff, start to really take off because parents are willing to pay more. So there's always a kind of seasonal aspect to it in that sense. But then, like, right now, it's clearance season. All these stores that were busy filling their uh, uh, aisles up with toys during uh, the Christmas season now need to get rid of all those toys as fast as they can. And so they're marking stuff down 50, 75% off trying to get rid of them. So there's kind of the cyclical aspect to it. Um, but then also, as you said, movies, you know, movies come out and you know, that can attach something to it. Like when frozen came out, frozen toys were some of the hottest things you could buy. If you had Elsa dolls, 
you were rich so long as you could sell them and you weren't restricted from right. it. Um, and, you know, when Rogue One came out, Rogue One toys started to take off. And, you know, there's always the next movie coming out. Um, but then there's always stuff that's on television that kids love. Um, and it, it changes, you know. At one time it was SpongeBob. Uh, another time it was Mickey Mouse. And another time it was Animaniacs. And, you know, now if you ask someone what Animaniacs is, they don't, they don't know what Animaniacs is. But, uh, you know, 10 years ago, Animaniacs was huge. And so there's always something in television that kids are watching. And there's always new toys coming out for those things. Um, so there's, there's a very cyp cyclical aspect to toys um, where, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to sit on the established brands to find your way. Um, and that's when we're teaching our folks, you know, how to interact with toys, we're always telling them, you know, you, you go wide for that reason, because you always want to keep your feelers out and what's going on. Um, you know, like you mentioned on like Target, Walmart brands, um, four or five years ago, you couldn't, you could not sell a Walmart brand item to save no. your life because nobody wanted it. Um, but now as their quality has started to increase and as they've kind of backed off of like showing you know this is a walmart brand but instead they've called it something else like my life girls or um wondertainment you know things like that they've tried to get around it um they've uh they've become more palatable to the average customer during the year and so um it's really widened the selection of things so um we kind of tell people there's really no off limits i mean obviously you have your restrictions if you're restricted you can't sell it but uh, in terms of whether or not something was sold, there's really no limit in the aisles in any toy store. Um, pretty much every major line, uh, every brand, pretty much every brand you find on a shelf in a toy store has something in it that people are buying. Uh, not necessarily always like amazing, super amazing stuff, but there's almost always something that somebody out there wants. And with Amazon becoming more and more go-to place, for people to buy something when they have that specific thing in mind. Um, the number of people looking for those things just increases every, every year that goes by. There, uh, there are things like a Toys R Us, like Toys R Us only brands that three or four years ago, you didn't even bother looking at them because they just, they were no good. But nowadays, because people are looking for like army men and Toys R Us has their own kind of brand army men, those have started to take off because just so many people go to the website looking for it. So, um, there's this really wide expanse of toys that uh, you can always get into as you go forward. And I know people get really concerned with the restrictions and rightfully so, because I mean, Amazon is not good at communicating policy to their sellers and telling people, Hey, in a week, you know, this brand's going to be restricted. No, they just, there you are. You have it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I understand that aspect of it. It is kind of scary in that sense. But uh, what I've also found is Amazon tends to be very fair to the people who have tried and been selling for a long time. Um, for instance, when this latest round of toy uh, restrictions went through, um, people who had been with our groups for a while, uh, most of them were not restricted in anything. And the reason was because we always tell people, buy wide, continue buying toys all year long. And what happened was, you know, they weren't restricted from Nerf because they've been buying and selling Nerf all year long. Uh, and the same thing for like all the other restricted brands. Uh, and it really, when you have that happen, it can become an asset to you. The restrictions go from being a hindrance to an asset when you're part of that group that is able to still sell. Um, there were fighters this year that had no business doing as well as they did, but because they were restricted, uh, not many people could sell them. And so there were the select few who could get on there and make good money, fewer people were the way. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily a good thing in the long run for Amazon to do, but um, there is that opportunity there for people who put in the work and uh, really learn how to interact with toys going forward um, because there's always something new. You know, Pokemon's restricted today, but there, there's going to be a new Pokemon this year. Uh, and by new Pokemon, I mean a new competitor to Pokemon mm. that can uh, fight against Pokemon, mm. you know, mm. so maybe you're not in on Pokemon, but get in on this one so that, you know, when the time comes, you're already established in that brand. Right. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think that um, the brand restrictions to a, um, to a point too is not a bad thing because I think Amazon is going to take the best of the best that are selling in those categories and that's what they want. And they're going to weed out, um, you know, the fakes and the people that, like you said, you, you made a good point about Frozen a couple of years ago when Frozen was really hot. Amazon slammed the door on Frozen with restrictions big time. And I happened to be able to sell in Frozen because I sold Frozen and we sold legitimate Frozen product. And, and we did well with it because of that. And I think the same thing's going to happen with the brands now is you're going to find out that people that are, are selling it um, in the shoe category, same thing, where you got the brand restrictions. The people that are allowed to sell in it and continue to sell in it are going to find that they're going to do very, very well because the other ones are not going to be allowed in there. So I think Amazon's trying to, to level the playing field, um, not from a seller standpoint, from a customer standpoint, to make it so that the customer understands that the platform is a good platform and their standards are high and they don't want fake stuff out there. They don't want that kind of thing. So, yeah. but I, I thought it was kind of interesting when you were talking about, you know, finding toys through the season. I can tell you that uh, a lot of people, when they go out looking for toys, they think it's the Walmart, the Targets, the, the Kmarts, the Sears, all those big stores, JC Penney, all those big stores. And it really, those can be viable, but, and I want your, um, your input on this, but there's more and more retail arbitrage people coming on all the time and really making that playing field a lot harder to, um, to penetrate because the ones that are coming on are, unless they're going through your course or courses like that, they're not Amazon educated. They come in and they think they're going to buy it for $5 and sell it for 30 because that's what Amazon says it's going for without doing any research. And when it doesn't, they panic and sell it for $5 to, to offload it. And there goes the price. I mean, they drive the price down. And I think that's what we need more of is more teaching and letting people learn the knowledge that they need to have to sell on Amazon. I think it would, it would benefit everybody to have that. Um, so I'm just curious as far as you buying toys, and I know my answer to this, as far, have you found because of competition, two, this is a two-part question. One, have you had the lower margins on your products to be able to sell the product that you do in toys? And two, have you done any bundling with toys, which is another thing that a lot of people won't do because they won't take the time to put a Barbie with a, with a Barbie coloring book and, and kind of make that bundle. And I know when you do those things, you stand out and you can sell them. Uh, I'm, I don't know about my mom. Personally, I don't do bundling because I just, I don't really care for it. I know it's a viable thing. I definitely would never tell anyone not to bundle. Um, but I just don't really care for it. And I've never really found the need to, I don't really have trouble filling out, uh, what I intend to buy for, uh, during any given period of time, um, with non bundle stuff. But when it comes to lowering margins, I can say that the way I have to interact with certain things have changed over the years. Um, it used to be sales, you know, you would go in and buy stuff on sale, like a Toys R Us and you could send it in and sell it. But as time's gone on, what happens is uh, these there are people who go into groups and get taught kind of the basics of toys, but never really the intricacies. So they're just told, go to the sales, go to the sales, go to the clearance, you know, and what they go. And what happens is those sales and those clearance items, they become super targeted by all of the uh, retail arbitrage folks. And so I've learned that 50% off is not necessarily a good thing <laughs> for everything. Um, it can actually lead to incredible price drops on Amazon. So I've kind of had to learn how to navigate properly through the sales, how 50% um, off at Toys R Us is a worse deal than 50% off at my local Myers store. Um, you know, how something available across the country is worse than something that I can only find down the street from me. Um, you know, there's there are things where... Uh, I've had to, there are times where I've had to walk past items in the store that, you know, if it was Q4, I would buy it because I know that the sales speeds would keep the margins high, but I know it's not Q4. And so I know that, you know, if you add 200 sellers to this listing, there's not going to be any money in it. And I also know that there's going to be 200 sellers on that listing fairly soon. Um, so there's definitely been a change in how I approach it. There have been plenty of times where I've lost margins because I, you know, when I was learning how to change that, um, and you know, even now on occasion, I still make mistakes and I still buy things that I wish I hadn't. 
Um, but for the most part, I still say that I hit between 70 and 100% on all my stuff. So in general, no, I haven't had to lose a lot of margins, but I have had to change how I interact with toys as the years have gone by to make sure those margins stay high. And we do focus a lot, um, like some of our best stuff comes from our local store, um, which is just like a regional store. And so we usually teach people to try to find that regional store or local store that they have. Um, because those tend to be the best places. A lot of times they're not um, toy centric. So like ours is a, mainly a grocery store and they just happen to have a few aisles of toys. And so they have to constantly turn their inventory over in toys all the time. So we'll find things that are on sale or deep discount or clearance even there that are still full price everywhere else. And so that helps us to get better margins sometimes um, than what people are finding if they're just going to Toys R Us or Target or Walmart and finding those same items. Um, and as far as bundles, I do um, bundle some stuff. Um, I don't usually make a bundle like to create one um, just because as a single mom, I'm still homeschooling. I mean, it's and running a business and trying to have a life and everything um, and then coaching and things like that. So, um, so I usually try to do things that are easier sometimes. Um, but as far as that goes, especially during back to school time, I bundle a lot during back to school time. Um, I do a lot of notebook and backpack bundles and just different things like that. Um, I do, I have been doing like a toothbrush and toothpaste bundle um, lately that's a kid's one. Even um, for us, we do sell things that are not toys, but they're usually still kid stuff. Um, uh, not a hundred percent, but I would say probably what 95 to 98% of our things have something to do with kids. It's a character. It might be clothes or shoes or health and beauty or kitchen or, you know, home stuff, but usually it is some kind of character kid type of thing. So, um, and that's one of the things that we like to teach and focus on in our coaching too, is that. Um, you can take what you're learning about all the toys and the toy trends that are going on and apply that across a broader range of categories. So you're not um, just focused on the toys. And if that action figure is not selling very well, well, maybe the blanket that has that action figure on it is selling very well. And so, um, so, you know, I do, I do have bundles sometimes in other categories and stuff too, that are not just in toys. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with you, um, both with the uh, the regional stuff. I think a lot of uh, people miss the boat on that, is um, whatever region you're in, if you've got that regional, and I, and I found it interesting you said grocery stores, because Kroger's seems to have, you know, a lot of toys in them, and the thing about Kroger's is it isn't a regional type store, and they do, even from, you know, town to town, they carry different items in those and I think people don't realize that just because it's a local you know it might be a small chain five six stores whatever or or you know like a small pharmacy or something like that they don't necessarily carry the same in every one of those and buying them in those local stores you really can find good deals when you're looking at the um the regional type aspect of it and the other thing I find is when you when you're going into like you know Toys R Us or any of the big stores, Walmart, and you buy Mattel you know, or you buy Hasbro. I think a lot of people don't realize that when the store buys it, when Toys R Us buys a Hasbro um, set of um, like action figures, and there may be, there's 12 to the case they're buying, and they have to buy all 12. They don't get to choose which action figures come in that mixed case. But what you get to choose is that out of that case, there may be one character out of the 12 and they're buying and that could be the hot character. That's what you got to look at when you're trying to look for things like that is to find that one hot character in there because that one's going to have the most value because it's the most hard to find. And I think a lot of people don't look at that when you're looking at, you know, certain toys that come in, you know, sets. The store doesn't get to choose what comes in that set. They have to buy the whole set. And I know I buy from Mattel and I buy from Hasbro direct and I can't say, man, 
you know, the yellow, the yellow Ranger is, you know, $45. And can you send me a case of those? Uh, no, you're going to get all those pukey ones in between that don't have any value to them. It's just the way it works. So yeah. I think um, the big stores do have some value if you look at it as the aspect of finding the scarcity one that comes in the set. We do that with um, Disney, like the, um, what's the, the Cars series movie where, you know, you got that Mater and there may be a very special Mater in that set that you're looking for. And we've done that, man. We've done that with the little character cars where, you know, you go into Walmart and they're $3 and you get that one in the set that's the rare one from the set. And it goes for $30. <laughs> so but then you buy the other ones and they're three sixty nine or even less than $3. And you say, wait a minute, Walmart's got it for $3. How could it be sold for less than Walmart's got it for? You know, so <laughs> it's just, you know, understanding those different types of concepts. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. And I want to go into more of, if somebody's new on here and they've never done toys, what would you tell them, and you probably tell them this in your coaching too, what would you um, suggest to them would be a good starting budget, especially coming off of fourth quarter? Fourth quarter, we can tell them, hey, if you buy something, you know, if it's not nailed down, it's going to sell. Whether or not you make money, I don't know. But it will sell <laughs> because toys sell all year, you know, sell in fourth quarter really good. But coming off of that, someone that wants to get in toys. I know the first thing you're going to say is go wide, not deep, because that's smart when you're first starting out. But what kind of budget do you think nowadays someone can um, actually start in toys and, you know, get to the point where they need to be? Um, it's a tough question because, I mean, it's going to differ between person to person. I mean, if someone picks up toys quick, I could tell them, you know, shoot for the moon. But if someone – you know, we have, there are people who've been in our groups who say, you know, I just, I don't get toys. Uh, and they still do okay in the toy category, but uh, it's just, it's not their niche. And so, um, you know, to somebody like that, we might tell them something different. But in general, what I would say is you should probably, when you're first starting out, you should probably only expect to make 50% of whatever you spend. Uh, if you're starting out in the toy category, all right. That's not the goal. The goal is always to be 100% or more. But because you have to take into account, you're probably going to make some mistakes. Um, you're probably going to misjudge something. Uh, it's better to just assume that whatever you start out with, you're going to make about 50% on. So, um, you know, whether you need $5,000 for your month or $2,000, you know, just assume that whatever it is, spend twice that. Um, and, you know, a lot of our people come back and say, I did 100% this month, which, you know, that's great. That's awesome. And we hope everyone everywhere can do that all the time. That's always our goal. But you just, you kind of have to assume when you're starting out that um, even no matter how much coaching you get, that you're going to screw up somewhere, uh, that you're going to make a buy that just didn't end up panning out the way that you thought it would, or Amazon will come in on a listing that you didn't see them in on before and kill the price or something for a while. Um, something always happens that'll hurt something you bought. Uh, so we, we tell people to assume that they'll make 50%, um, even though we expect they'll probably make more than that. Um, in general, I'd say most people average between 70 and 120, just in that kind of area um, on whatever they buy. But if you assume 50% and you that means you buy twice as much as you plan to make, um, you kind of safeguard against the chance that you don't end up making a hundred percent on things. And I think too, um, one thing when you're at the beginning, I mean, really people can start with $50 and build up into a viable business. So it's not really necessarily like how much that they have to start with. It's more making sure that you're making wise buying decisions from the beginning. Um, to make sure that you capitalize on whatever it is that you're investing. So um, we definitely don't want you losing even that $50 that you have invested. So um, I think one of the main things that um, is different now than when we first started is the way that Amazon has kind of changed their policies and, and their fees and everything. It's more important than ever to get fast turning inventory. Uh, which is what we teach in all of our coaching because um, between their changes with their long-term storage fees and 
even raising the regular storage fees all year and especially during Q4. Um, those were some scary storage fees, I know, for a lot of people. Um, and so I think that um, I think that now more than that. ever. Huh? <laughs> You had to mention that. I think we paid for November and December. I think we paid twenty three thousand in storage fees. Oh man! But we also had over a million dollars in inventory there for the for the holiday, you know. So, right. But if you don't have it there, you can't sell it. So, I mean, for us, it's not a bad thing because we made a lot of money. But it still it hurts when Amazon takes that out of you. You know, that's all profit. You just it's right. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's especially important when you're just starting. You know. If you only have five hundred dollars, those storage fees will eat away that five hundred dollars really quick. So it's really important to get your stuff turning around fast in the beginning. We always tell people, you know, down the line when you're self-sufficient and you're making stuff every month, turning it over, you can buy those things that you hold on to for six months to sell, you know, at Q4 or something. But if you're just starting out, you should not be buying in January to sell for Q4 because if you need money now you won't get that money now on that stuff. You know, you're, you're not going to see that money for 12 months at that rate. Yeah. And it's just, I, we even, we had quite a few new sellers in our Q4 group who were lamenting the fact that their items that they had purchased before they joined the group just weren't selling um, because they didn't understand how ranks worked. And so, um, and, and ranks are much different for toys during Q4 than they are during the rest of the year. So ranks that might have been okay during Q4 are not gonna be good during the rest of the year. And so, you know, we had several sellers who had, you know, tried to stay under that 5% range and were buying toys with ranks of, you know, 500,000 and couldn't figure out why that they weren't selling within just a month or two. And so, you know, um, once that they came into the group and we kind of started teaching on what ranks are actually good in toys, which is generally, um, we usually say to stay under a hundred thousand, um, during the bulk of the year. And actually we really recommend for fast turnaround to stay under 50,000, um, if you can. And so, um, you know, once that they realized that, then they had inventory that was turning over faster. And so I think that that's something um, at the beginning when people are first starting out that when they don't um, totally understand how ranks are working, especially in toys, and especially because a lot of times you have sellers who start during Q4. That's what, you know, that's what I did. That's when we were working together, uh, the business at the beginning, I started during Q4. And so, you know, it was, um, it was just a matter of trying to figure out, okay, you know, things that were selling so fast, I could literally could not keep them in stock during Q4. How is that going to happen during the rest of the year? So, um, so that's one thing that I think new sellers just need to take into consideration and, and to be careful. Yeah. And I think, I think you're right there. Um, but there is a little bit a difference that I have. Um, in my toys, we say around 1% to 3%. I mean, and that's basically all year round. I don't care if it's fourth quarter, first quarter. I know 1% to 3%. But I do also look at toys at a 250000 to 400000 range only if I know there's not that many Amazon sellers on it because then you've got the long tail. But, again, that's someone that's a seasoned seller that mm -hmm. has – know that knows that those products are going to sell if you give them a little bit of time to sell because there's not that many sellers on there and you can actually like if there's three or four amazon fba sellers i can compete with that i can get the buy boxes stay with them and compete and make my margins on a 250,000 to 500,000 range toy but on an everyday new person that on an everyday item even fourth quarter if you're within a one to three percent and you can stay in that buy box and, and it's profitable to you you're going to make money because it's going to turn, especially in fourth quarter. So that's the one thing. I want to go into a, some questions now. We have some questions here for you. So um, okay. let's see. Ada says, can <laughs> Ada, you always, she, I love Ada. She's like, can you share your sales from Q4? <laughs> they did 3 million, Ada. <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> for actually I have not gone back and done the math unfortunately uh, I know that from I know that from 
the beginning of December to the 17th was at least 80,000 uh, from December 1st to the 17th. That was just the kind of two weeks that I actually paid attention. I don't know what the full sales for the whole Q4 was. I'm sorry. Sorry. So I get, I got a question. So if Q4 is still the bulk of your business, right? Nah, I'd say it's about 20%. So I mean, it's, it's a little more, but it's not, it's not like insanely more. So uh, you are, so your toys actually do well all year round. So what oh, was yeah. your year? What was your year like from start to finish? Like, what did you like? What did you end up in 2015? And then what was your growth in 2016? In 2015, I think in 2015, I did 180 thousand over the year. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure I at least doubled that in 2016. I haven't I haven't gone back and looked at my numbers, but if I didn't double it, I would be surprised. And that and and guys, when he's when um, Seth is talking about doubling it, he's talking about doubling it as Amazon and all these commercials are out there like join Amazon, sell on Amazon. And more and more retail arbitrage people are coming in from all over the world, not just in the US. So for him to be doubling it, what does that tell you guys? It tells you that guess what? Retail arbitrage is not dead. Like a lot of people think it's dead. It's not dead. It's still viable and it's still a working model if you work it the right way and you work it the way, like he said, the regional stores and doing the things that I think Seth thinks a little bit out of the box more than some other people that are out there going to the mainstream. You go to mainstream, it's like anything else. If you see buy one, get one free at Toys R Us, are you going to go buy it? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't get me excited because I know there's 17,000 Toys R Us and buy one, get one free are going to be in every one of those stores. And it's, where is it going to end up? It's going to end up on Amazon. You think you've got it on deal because it's 50%. You go and put it out there and find out, like what Seth said, there's 200 other sellers selling it. Now what do you do? You're stuck with the product. You get you panic because you're new. You, you, you lower the price. You tank the price. And everybody else that's on there that was trying to make money now is going to suffer in the process. They're going to have to either do the same or win it out. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's definitely a viable market that's still out there. Let's see. Do you buy toys now and save it for Q4? Ooh, I did that with I do that with like when clearance items like I'll buy like Halloween items. Like we went into a Kmart one year and wiped out Kmart's whole Halloween section at 90% off and made a killing for two years straight after that. But again, you're talking having the capital to do that. So yeah. if Seth was um, to answer this, he's probably gonna say he has capital to do that. But if you're just starting out, I don't think you hold you don't know, hold toys. Yeah, I, I would never suggest someone who's just starting out to even try that. Um, yeah. Especially if you're doing full FBA, you will pay so much more in fees than you will ever make on those items if you're doing FBA with them. Um, if you plan to hold on to them like at your house, you have a little more leeway. You know, like a house warehouse but even then we don't encourage it because any money you spend in january is money that you could have turned over 12 24 times before you get to q4 and could have made you so much more during that time than anything you would make on what you bought in january but if you have the capital you can do it now i don't do it i don't buy in january for Q4, I don't actually buy from Q4 until uh, late October, early November, because in general, in the toy category, stuff that's really popular right now is not gonna be really popular in Q4. Now that's not across the board, every single thing is gonna fall off, but um, I can name at least six brands from Q4 of 2015 that you could not sell at half price in 2016. Um, you would have lost so much money on them. It's not even funny, even though they were some of the hottest items in 2015, uh, because it's just, it's a shifting market. You know, you know, new TV shows come out, kids interest changes to those new TV shows. So they shift this way. And then uh, this movie comes out and it shifts them another way. And then these popular books appear and shifts them that way. And they're always moving to something else. Yes. You always have like the power Rangers, the transformers, you know, the things that are the mainstays, but even then, within those brands there's always something new every year so you know 
the Transformers that were popular last year have probably been completely replaced by the time we get to Q4 of 2017. Um, and some of them might be good, sure, but the majority of them will not be. Um, so we don't really encourage it for people who um, are newer, and honestly, even people who aren't newer, because in general, you'll make more money if you're buying and selling right now rather than buying and waiting on it. Um, cause it, like you said, with the Halloween stuff, 90% off, that's kind of a different thing because you don't generally get toys 90% off that are popular. Um, because popular toys don't tend to go on clearance. Um, they usually are still selling at full price right up into the time when they stop making them. The toys you see 90% off tend to be toys that are 90% off for a reason because people don't really want them anymore. Um, and you know, seasonal stuff, they have to get rid of that stuff whenever the season is over. They can't hold that in their store. Um, but Walmart doesn't have to get rid of their Hot Wheels when Christmas ends. They just need to get rid of the ones that aren't doing as well. So uh, what tends to happen is you get a lot of clearance. Some of it, like for instance, um, in the last couple of days, I've been going, getting some toys to buy. I think I spent about six or seven thousand dollars in the last couple of days just on some clearance toys in my area, and I would say the majority of them are what you would call well-ranked, popular toys. But I do not expect any of them to be well-ranked, popular toys in twelve months. I, I I expect none of them to be. So I will not be holding any of them because uh, in twelve months it's very likely that most of those toys especially their lines, like for instance, even Rogue One toys from Star Wars, 12 months from now are not likely to be very popular because Star Wars Episode Eight is going to be out and everyone's going to be talking about Star Wars Episode Eight. So um, we don't really encourage it uh, unless you really have the capital and you're okay with the fact that you're not going to make any money on that money that you just spent for at least 10 or 11 months. Yeah, and, um, and like what you said too, even on clearance toys, I mean, you got to watch that when you buy deep. I mean, if you got some capital and you can do it, I know that we've had toys where, you know, I don't suggest anybody do this, but we've held toys for three years and three years from now they come back around and they're, I mean, I've seen toys go from $20 to $200 in three years because now the scarcities and I got to have this toy. This toy was, you know, you can't find it anymore, but I don't suggest that with anybody that, you know, is starting out or doesn't have capital to be able to do that. But, um, like you said, with the Halloween things and things like that, I mean, I have stores and store managers that I can call up and I just tell them, like, I have one that's going to let me know as soon as their seasonal stuff changes. She calls me up and she'll tell me, you know, she's got 75% off her, her toys and she knows I'm going to come down there and wipe her out. And just, you know, and just when you get it at those deep discounts, it's a good, a good buy. But, um, and not everybody gets those buys. So, but when you're, when you're just buying clearance and you got to look at clearance too, in some stores, is clearance really clearance? You know, I, how many times have you walked into a Walmart and the clearance price, it said $79 on sale or clearance at $19.99 and it was on Amazon for $12.99. So yeah. was that really clearance that price? Or, I mean, so, I mean, you can't think the price tank that much. So yeah, so you got to be careful. I mean, there are things um, in this, like you said, the seasonal type stuff is, is really can really do well for you in toys too. Um, let's see. We have another question here from Ron. Just starting in toys and recently bought a few pieces of Hot Wheels sets. Does that still work? Um, well, I mean, Hot Wheels is a huge line. So Hot Wheels sets is pretty generic. I'm not really sure what specific ones you're talking about. Um, Yes, Hot Wheels are still very popular, and if you got them for a good price and they were selling for a good price and had a good rank, then yes, you should expect them to do well. Um, but I can think of like 12 different current Hot Wheels sets just right now, and that's not counting the individual pieces in between them. So uh, I can't tell you specifically if that one is going to do well um, just because there's so many of them. But I can tell you the Hot Wheels as a whole is still very popular. So uh, on that front, at least, you don't have to worry about it. And my take on that, Ron, is that on the Hot Wheels sets, like what I was talking about with Mattel and Hasbro, if you're buying Hot Wheels and you're buying it where the store had to buy it by the case and it's a mixed case, 
I would look at the one that was the one in the case that maybe had only one tool case. Those sets are going to have more value than the other ones. For me, Hot Wheels, um, for the most part, the main brand stuff, it's just tanked. I mean, it's just Hot Wheel brand out there just doesn't do as well as it used to. Um, for the simple fact, it's, it's everywhere. Now, there are sets that you can get from Hot Wheels like Mattel and like um, Hasbro type products too, um, where they don't sell them to Toys R Us and they don't sell them to Walmart. They sell to a smaller market. So they do have their criteria of what Walmart and those big stores can buy, but then you can buy the other ones that are not for the Walmarts and the Targets. And they have a list of those from any of those places, Mattel, Hasbro, Hot Wheels, and they can tell you what Walmart and the other stores don't buy. And those are the ones that are gonna have more value because you're not gonna see them everywhere like you would in a Walmart and Target so, or Toys R Us. So those are some of the things I would look at if you're gonna stick with that main brand, you know, that name, Hot Wheels, Hasbro, Mattel. I mean, Barbie dolls, I mean, I don't wanna get on that subject, but Barbie dolls, I mean, they used to be yeah. worth something. They ain't worth anything anymore, as far as I'm we concerned. Always, uh, we always suggest to people who want to get into those brands to look at the last series. Don't look at the current series. The current series is going to be so saturated. It's not even funny. Um, in fact, uh, if anyone knows what a Monster High doll is, five years ago, you could have yeah. made crazy money on Monster High. I made a living off Monster High for a whole year. Um, you could not buy any of the current Monster High dolls and sell them for good money. Uh, except for like, you know, store specific ones or like Comic Con type ones, but like the general ones that are current in any store, you won't make any money on them. But if you look at the last series, the ones that have uh, gone out of production, but you can still find in stores, um, you start to see those go up. And it's the same with most of the main brands. If you're looking at the current series for the ones that are established, like Transformers, Hot Wheels, uh, Power Rangers, for the most part, they're not good because. Those are the ones Amazon's selling. Those are the ones that Toys R Us is keeping really stocked really well. Those are the ones that every decent toy seller on the planet is aware of. So, um, you know, you're up against a lot of competition when you're in that. But if you're looking at the stuff that was from six months ago, that was current six months ago or a year ago, you know, like that, you're looking at not only a lot less competition because one, you don't have to fight Amazon usually, um, but also because people are less aware of it, but also you're looking at uh, generally clearance, you know, even if it's not huge clearance, you're generally looking at a discount on them. Um, rarity, uh, most stores won't be carrying, you know, full stock because they're not restocking them. They're, you're just buying what's left over on the shelf. Um, and plus, you're generally looking at uh, collectors. Uh, for instance, with Transformers especially, collectors generally don't start buying until the first wave of that series is done because they want to see what am I looking at? You know, what am I looking at with what's here? Are they going to come out with something new, uh, something better in the next six months? And so what happens is when they start to go out of stock and they start to be discontinued, they say, all right, I actually want that series. That one's pretty cool. Or if they don't want it, they say, I don't want that series. And so um, we generally tell people when they are looking at those really big brands and we're not talking like a Paw Patrol you know, Hasbro, like something newer or Shimmer and Shine uh, or six months from now, whatever else is new out. We're talking about really established stuff that's been around for years. We tell them, look at the past because that's where most of the money is, uh, which isn't to say there's never anything good in the new stuff. But in general, the past is where the most consistent money is at in those things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you were just talking about, um, and this goes to Ron's question about the Hot Wheels too. Um, Regional stores, uh, you, you go into the regional small stores and they got Hot Wheels in there or they got the Monster High dolls especially, um, guess what? Those stores are not getting what Walmart gets. First of all, they don't want to compete with Walmart and they can't compete with Walmart. So they're buying the Monster High dolls that are unique and made especially for smaller stores. So those things are going to have a little bit more value because of the scarcity versus the ones that you're going to find on a Walmart store or a Toys R Us store or something like that. So. I would look for those too, Ron, if you're looking for Hot Wheels. I would be looking for those smaller regional type stores that um, carry those type of things because I can almost guarantee you, if you find a Hot Wheels in a Fred's Pharmacy or a Rite Aid or a Walgreens, I'm almost ready to bet the farm you won't see it in a Walmart because Walmart, they're not going to carry something that Walmart has. So those type of things you want to look at. And I can tell you right now, pharmacies like Rite Aid and 
Walgreens, man, we cleaned up on Walgreens with the matter car. Matter car was in there for like six bucks and we were getting like 25, 30 bucks and it was just flying off the Amazon shelves as we say. Um, and that's just because we took the time to walk in there and guess what? It wasn't even Christmas time yet. And they decided, Hey, we're going to do 50% off these things. And we said, Hey, that looks good to me. And we bought those things and, and they did well for you. So definitely want to be looking at regional type stores. And when you're, when you're looking for, um, those type of a branded type products to be able to compete that that, um, Walmart target and all those Toys R Us, those type stores don't have. We have a, Another question here in my Q&A from Ken. Ken says, when Seth says 50 to 100%, is that profit, sales turnover, or product, or what? Generally, we talk in ROI. So that is, uh, if you spend $10, 100% ROI would be you make $10 on it. So that's generally what we're talking about. Um, so yeah, I think you're referencing when I was talking about someone new to the toy market. So when I was saying like, you should expect to make 50%. That is, if you spend 5,000, expect to make 2,500. Even though, you know, if you're doing it right, you probably will make closer to 5,000, but expect to make 2,500 to kind of keep your expectations in line with what you're going out for. Because um, we see people get caught up sometimes in uh, profit, and so they lose sight of the other things, uh, like rank. Uh, we know some people who, um, there's, there's a lady we know, uh, she tried to do the same thing we did. She would go around the stores in the area, buy a lot of stuff, and it would be great profit, but would never sell because it had just terrible ranks. So she got, she had to return so much stuff to Toys R Us at one point that they banned her from returning stuff to Toys R Us. Um, and that eats into your profit huge, you know? I mean, that's a loss for her because eventually she just had to hold on to stuff because they wouldn't take it back. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, you're necessarily going to be that bad if you let, you know, if you let your gaze slip for a minute. But um, if you lose sight of everything, the whole picture, ranks, ROI, um, Amazon competition, you know, all, all those things, if you lose sight of one because you see the ROI is, you know, 200%, well, if it's ranked 500,000, you're not going to see that 200% for four or five months probably, which means that during that time, if you bought something that was only 50%, you could have turned it over four or five times and maybe made even more money than you would have on that one item. Um, so you kind of have to temper yourself, especially if you're new and kind of be careful with how you uh, get wrapped up in the profit because more profit is not necessarily always the best thing when you're buying an item. Sometimes it's more important for it to sell than it is for you to uh, get 150, 200% ROI on it. And when we're saying ROI, we mean like after fees and stuff. Yeah. So after yeah. all your after Amazon, Amazon fees, fees and everything is out, yeah. Exactly. Hey guys, we're going over an hour here. You guys have done great. I appreciate you guys being on here. If the, anybody wants to reach out and find out about you guys, how can they get in contact with you um, if they want have any questions or anything they want to find out more about you? Um, we actually have um, on my website, which is playdreamgrow.com, um, we have a product page on there, which um, there is... Um, Um, but we actually have a co new coaching group that's going to start in February. Um, it comes with the course and also three months of coaching. And we, um, and I think I sent that to you, John, that we had, um, a special coupon code. Yeah, I have that, but can I get off? Can I click out of here and will it still, will it keep my screen up? I'm not familiar with Zoom, so I don't know if I can click away and come back. Well, if it should be fine. Yeah. If you don't close out Zoom totally, then all right. yeah. <laughs> Other, if you close out Zoom totally, we're all gone. All right, I'm gonna find that. I'm not gonna close it, and um, you guys just keep talking. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So that is coming up, and um, and there's also there's a contact me page on my website and stuff that you can if you had a question about that. Um. So yes, we um. We designed a course. I think I might have mentioned that 
um, earlier when I was um, kind of doing an introduction, but we had designed a course teaching essentially going through our entire thought process of, you know, how do we um, go from start to finish in making buying decisions for buying toys and stuff. Um, so that is up there. And then, um, and then three times a year, which one time is our Q4 group. Um, but two other times during the year, we have a spring group and a summer group. Um, and for three months, that's when we do our coaching. We do Zoom calls like this once a month where we take all the questions live. Uh, we're in the group um, talking and answering questions almost every day. Sometimes we try to at least take weekends off. Um, we don't usually do that during Q4 because it's so crazy and time crunched. But um, but yeah, so we do that and uh, we also, we started a new thing um, in our Q4 group where we did Facebook live videos of us going to Toys R Us and sourcing, uh, which seems to be a really big hit. And um, so we have promised that we will keep those up in the groups going forward. Mm -hmm. So we'll take you along with us while we actually go out sourcing at Toys R Us. Um, so we do things like that. Um, and then, you know, we really try to, um, while we're in the group, Seth and I, one thing about working together as a family, we know each other so well, and we also compliment each other. Um, not like, hey, you're really great, but we compliment each other as far as we work together really well. And our styles mesh together really well. Um, Seth is, um, he loves to do, um, videos and, and things like that. So he'll do a lot of teaching videos for the group. I like to personally write things down. I would much rather write than, um, talk most of the time. So, um, so I will write things down and, you know, we do trainings and teach how to go through things for this next group that we have coming up. We're going to, um, because of the time period, because we, during every group that we do, we really spend a lot of time focusing on um, on what is going on currently. And so, um, so like for this next group coming up, we're probably gonna talk a lot about clearance. We're gonna talk, um, we'll be talking about getting ready for summer towards the end of it, um, things like that. We'll also cover Easter because that's gonna come into the middle of it. Um, and then for our summer groups, we will talk a lot about back to school and kind of the pre Q4 prep um, part of it as you get into August and everything. Um, and then we have our Q4 group that we do every year. So, um, so we really enjoy coaching. That's one of the things that we really like to do. We also do a Friday Q and A. Um, which has been a really good thing. So we just open up a thread for everybody to post all their questions and then we record the answers because we found um, that it's, we can usually go into a lot more detail if we record answers um, than just writing out the answers to questions. So, um, so we'll also do that. We do that every Friday except for Zoom conference call weeks. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we just, we really love selling toys. We think it's a lot of fun. And, um, and we've had a lot of people come into our groups that are, are scared of toys. They're literally scared to go into a toy dress because it just overwhelms them to look at everything. And, um, and you know, I mean, there are millions of choices in the toy category. And so Seth and I work hard to break that down and make it manageable for people and um, and we've had some of those same people who were scared to death to walk into Toys R Us who now all of a sudden love toys and it makes up the most of their business. So um, it's, it's just a lot of fun and we have a lot of fun in our groups and um, we work hard to make sure it's a, um, an encouraging and positive place to be. And, and um, so, yeah, so I don't know, <laughs> that's, that's us and that's what we do. For our coaching <laughs> I put the link in there if they want to check it out with the uh, coupon code that you have uh, for them for the special webinar so if anybody wants to check out Beth and Seth and what they have to offer I would personally look into it and, and see if it's something for you toys like I said toys to me is a is a real easy entry point if you're gonna get on Amazon mm -hmm. it's probably one of the easiest things and everybody out there you know 
is trying to do it. But if you've got people out here that have done it, and like what Seth said earlier when we started this webinar, he basically said, you know what, he's made mistakes. And I can tell you that um, along with Seth, I've been doing this for years now, and guess what, I'm still making mistakes. We're all gonna make mistakes. But what I always say, and, uh, and I'll leave you guys with this, is that when you are making mistakes, you are not feeling, you are feeling forward. And if you have the mindset of feeling forward, um, the great Jim Corcoran always talks about slow and steady wins the race. Feel forward, keep going slow and steady, and you guys will win the race. Guys, God bless. Thank you for coming on here. It's been a real pleasure. I'm going to give you guys the last word. I'm just excited that I got through my very first Zoom <laughs> webinar. Uh, webinar GM, I've kind of mastered that. I know that pretty well, so this was kind of different for me. So. Again, like I said, if you guys ever want to come on here, I do paid workshops, like I told you in the beginning. If you guys want to come on here and do a workshop and really get into the nitty gritty of how to teach people um, actionable steps, we can talk about that too. Just email me and we can set something up. Great. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you having us on here. It's been great. We always love to talk about toys. So, um, and we appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and talk to all of your followers, so. It's been my pleasure. And, and hey, Seth, Ada's still saying you need to smile, so I think we need to leave with a smile. I, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave with the smile. <laughs> there we go. Thanks again, guys. God bless and you take care. Thanks. Thanks.